to Mistress uh, Nett as part of the British Irish uh, Council. And I think uh, it, I'd be interested to know were they aware of the alarming similarities uh, in terms of the crisis in the health services, both north and south of this island and in the UK. And I say that because today uh, health workers in the north are on strike. Uh, on December the 18th, nurses will come out on strike. They're on work to rule today. Other health workers are, are already on strike. And the reason they're on strike is because of a really shocking inequality between nurses and health workers in the NHS in the north and those in Britain, uh, where nurses and health workers in the north get paid less, have caps on their pay, than their equivalents uh, in the UK. This shocking inequality uh, was uh, initially supported by DUP health ministers in the Assembly and then maintained by Michelle O'Neill, uh, Sinn Féin minister, uh, when she was health minister in 2017. Uh, and uh, certainly for, on behalf of people before profit, I want to say, just as we said to nurses when they went out on strike for decent paying conditions in the South, that we fully support health workers in the North fighting for pay parity. Uh, and what's at stake is actually the quality of health services in the North, which are suffering exactly the same problems as our health service uh, down here. Massively high waiting lists, huge overcrowding, terrible conditions uh, for uh, health workers, uh, and as a result, uh, they can't recruit enough health workers, and those health workers are leaving to go and work for agencies or just leaving the country uh, altogether. Sounds very familiar, last count, Corla, uh, doesn't it? So, in the worst way, uh, we have uh, similarities north and south and in the UK in the mistreatment and the underinvestment in our health services. But I think uh, we should all support the nurses and the health workers uh, in the north who are taking industrial action to remedy that inequality. Tisha, to respond to the supplementary. Thanks, um, thanks very much. Um, um, just to say that, that when it comes to the British Irish Council, it hasn't been the norm for the United Kingdom Prime Minister to attend uh, since its inception. Uh, I think David Cameron, Cameron may have attended one of the meetings, uh, perhaps in London um, or a few uh, during his term of office, but it's been the norm since its inception to uh, send a, a different senior cabinet minister um, uh, to, um, to attend the BIC to represent the uh, UK government. Uh, in terms of the future role, um, I, I believe both the British Irish Council and the BIIGC uh, can have an, an enhanced future role uh, after Brexit, uh, with the British Irish Council um, perhaps taking responsibility for monitoring issues around the common travel area, and maybe even security cooperation as well, and cooperation among the regions, uh, and the British Irish Governmental Council, um, which really operates on an ad hoc basis, uh, becoming more permanent, more structured with regular meetings, uh, perhaps one summit once a year involving the two heads of government uh, and then um, bilateral meetings involving ministers and their teams because uh, when the UK leaves the European Union um, we'll still have a lot to talk about uh, and we won't have the opportunity to meet four or five times a year in Brussels uh, as we do now. Um, and I know Deputy Martin mentioned that the Nord Nordic Council as a potential model and I think that's uh, uh, something that we need to examine. Um, the intention now is to take it up with the Prime Minister after their elections, which happen next week, as you know. Uh, the Scottish independence referendum, uh, First Minister Surgeon took the opportunity to brief me on her thoughts and her plans about it, uh, and she informed me that it was her intention and the intention of the Scottish Government to have a second referendum in Scotland on independence uh, in the next um, a number of years, uh, but of course uh, they will need the consent of the UK Government to do that. And uh, that may depend on the outcome of the elections next week as well. On the general situation in Northern Ireland, um, it is very dynamic at the moment. There are a lot of uh, moving parts. Um, one is the outcome of the Westminster elections, which will uh, impact uh, on things next week, um, as to who is the uh, Prime Minister, the Cabinet, and uh, whether that government has a majority or not. Uh, and then also there's still uncertainty about Brexit and whether the withdrawal agreement uh, can be ratified. Um, but I think there's a potential in the next couple of weeks uh, for us to get some certainty both on the composition of the UK government uh, and also uh, on the UK's intentions with regard to Brexit. And I think that creates the opportunity for talks to resume uh, in Northern Ireland um, around uh, re-establishing the institutions, getting them functioning again, uh, and also uh, the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. 
Uh, Deputy Boyd Barrett raised the um, problems that uh, are being experienced in the health service uh, in Northern Ireland, and um, I make the point of at least looking at the front pages of all the Northern Ireland newspapers every day, uh, and uh, he's absolutely right. Um, there, there's a major, major problems um, in the health service in Northern Ireland that are not dissimilar to the ones faced here in the UK, or indeed in very many jurisdictions around the Western world. I think the front page of the Belfast Telegraph for the past three or four days has been leading with uh, health stories um, around the strikes, uh, around problems with cancer tests, uh, around problems with waiting lists and access. Um, and it is uh, sadly a feature of um, the vast majority of public health services in the Western world um, to different extents, and the extents do vary. Um, the problems are very similar. Um, waiting times, uh, overcrowding in emergency departments, uh, difficulty recruiting uh, and retaining staff. I know the German health minister is currently seeking uh, 50,000 more nurses. Uh, the UK NHS talks about uh, one or well, I think 100,000 vacancies, um, and uh, even the whole issue of overspending uh, and um, health trusts and so on uh, not being able to stick to budget uh, again are very similar, uh, albeit to different extents and different levels of severity in different jurisdictions. Uh, one thing, though, we should. Off, should say about our health service, which often gets missed, uh, often the focus is always on, on overcrowding and trolleys and understand why that is. Um, what we don't focus on, um, which I think is unfair on our health service and our health service staff, uh, a little bit more is patient outcomes. You know, the fact that, for example, somebody who uh, gets cancer in Ireland has a better chance of survival than somebody who uh, gets cancer and gets treated by the NHS in any part of the NHS, uh, Scotland, England, Wales or Northern Ireland. Uh, the fact that we're seeing uh, real improvements in patient outcomes around stroke, around heart attack, life expectancy, um, all of those patient outcomes and indicators in our health service are going in the right direction. And that doesn't happen by accident, it happens because of investment, because of good strategies, good policies, and also the phenomenal work of the staff who work in our health service, and I think that should be recognised more. Next, 